Section 10 of Mr. Fortune's Practice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Mr. Fortune's Practice by H. C. Bailey. The Unknown Murderer Continued. Hello, Gerald, Reggie said quietly. Mother sent me up to make you all right again. He took the child's hand and felt for the pulse. I'm Mr. Fortune. Your fortune. Good fortune. The child tried to smile, and Reggie's hands moved over the uneasy body, and all the while he murmured softly nonsense talk. The child did not want him to go, but at last he went off with Eden into a corner of the room. Quite right to send for me, he said gravely and Eden put his hand to his head. I know, it's horrible when it's a child. One of the irritant poisons. Probably arsenic. Have you given an emetic? He's been very sick, and he's so weak. I know. Have you got anything with you? I sent home, but I didn't care to. I'll do it. Sulfate of zinc. You go and send for a nurse and find some safe milk. I wouldn't use the household stuff. "'My God, Fortune, surely it was at the party.' "'Not the household stuff,' Reggie repeated, and he went back to the child. It was many hours afterward that he came softly downstairs. In the hall, husband and wife met him. It seemed to him that it was the man who had been crying. "'Are you going away?' Mrs. Warnham said. "'There is no more pain. He is asleep.' Her eyes darken. "'You mean he's dead?' the man gasped. I hope he'll live longer than any of us, Captain Warnham, but no one must disturb him. The nurse will be watching, you know, and I'm sure we all want to sleep sound, don't we? He was gone, but he stayed a moment on the doorstep. He heard emotions within. On the next afternoon, Dr. Eden came into his laboratory at St. Saviour's. One moment, one moment. Reggie was bent over a notebook. When I go to hell, they'll set me doing sums. He frowned at his figures. The third time is lucky. That's plausible, if it isn't right. Well, how's our large patient? He's doing well, quite easy and cheerful. Reggie stood up. I think we might say, thank God. Yes, rather. I thought he was gone last night, Fortune. He would have been without you. It was wonderful how he bucked up in your hands. You ought to have been a children's specialist. My dear chap, oh, my dear chap, I'm the kind of fellow who would always ought to have been something else. And so I'm doing sums in a laboratory, which God knows I'm not fit for. Have you found out what it was? Oh, arsenic, of course. Quite a fair dose he must have had. It's queer how they always will use arsenic. Eden stared at him. "'What are we to do?' he said in a low voice. "'Fortune, I suppose it couldn't have been accidental. "'What is a child likely to eat "'in which he would find grains of accidental arsenic? "'Yes, but then, I mean, who could want to kill that child? "'That is the unknown quantity in the equation, "'but people do want to murder children, quite nice children.' "'Eden grew pale. "'What do you mean? "'You know he's not Warnham's child.' Warnham's his stepfather. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen the two together? Eden hesitated. He, well, he didn't seem to take to Warnham, but I'd have sworn Warnham was fond of him. And that's all quite natural, isn't it? Well, well, I hope he's in. What do you mean to do? Tell Mrs. Warnham with her husband listening. Dr. Eden followed him out like a man going to be hanged. Mrs. Warnham indeed met them in her hall. Mr. Fortune, she took his hand. She had won back her old calm, but her eyes grew dark as she looked at him. Gerald has been asking for you, and I want to speak to you. I shall be glad to talk over the case with you and Captain Warnham, said Reggie gravely. I'll see the small boy first, if you don't mind. And the small boy kept his Mr. Fortune a long time. Mrs. Warnham had her husband with her when the doctors came down. I say, Fortune, Captain Warnham started up. Awfully good of you to take so much trouble. 
I mean to say, he cleared his throat. I feel it, you know. How is the little beggar? There's no reason why he shouldn't do well, Reggie said slowly. But it's a strange case, Captain Warnham. Yes, a strange case. You may take it. There is no doubt the child was poisoned. Poison! Warnham cried out in that queer, hoarse voice. You mean it was something Gerald shouldn't have eaten? Mrs. Warnham said gently. It was arsenic, Captain Warnham. Not much more than an hour before the time he felt ill, perhaps less, he had swallowed enough arsenic to kill him. I say, are you certain of all that? I mean to say, no doubt about anything? Warnham was flushed. Arsenic, and the time, and the dose? It's pretty thick, you know. There is no doubt I have found arsenic. I can estimate the dose, and arsenic acts within that time. But I can't believe it, Mrs. Warnham said. It would be too horribly cruel. Dr. Fortune, couldn't it have been an accident, something in his food? It was certainly in his food or drink, but not accident, Mrs. Warnham. That is not possible. I say, let's have it all out, Fortune, Warnham growled. Do you suspect anyone? That's rather for you, isn't it, said Reggie. Who would want to poison Gerald? Mrs. Warnham cried. He says someone did, Warnham growled. When do you suppose he took the stuff, Fortune? At the party or after he came home? What did he have when he came home? Warnham looked at his wife. Only a little milk. He wouldn't eat anything, she said. And I tasted his milk. I remember. It was quite nice. That points to the party, Eden said. But I can't believe it. Who would want to poison Gerald? I've seen some of the people who were there, Eden frowned. I don't believe there's another child ill. Only this one of the whole party. Yes, yes, a strange case, said Reggie. Was there anyone there with a grudge against you, Mrs. Warnham? I don't think there's anyone with a grudge against me in the world. I don't believe there is, Catherine, her husband looked at her. But, damn it, Fortune found the stuff in the child. I say, Fortune, what do you advise? You're sure of your own household? There's nobody here jealous of the child? Mrs. Warnham looked her distress. I couldn't, I couldn't doubt anybody. There isn't any reason. You know, it doesn't seem real. And there it is, Warnham growled. Yes, well, I shouldn't talk about it, you know. When he's up again, take him right away, somewhere quiet. You'll live with him yourself, of course. That's all safe. And I, well, I shan't forget the case. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Fortune, she started up and caught his hands. Yes, yes, good-bye, said Reggie, and got away. But as Warnham let them out, he felt Warnham's lean hand grip into his arm. A little homely comfort would be grateful, Reggie murmured. Come and have tea at the Academy's Eden. They keep a pleasing muffin. He sank down in his car at Eden's side with a happy sigh. But Eden's brow was troubled. Do you think the child will be safe now, Fortune, he said? Oh, I think so. If it was Warnham or Mrs. Warnham who poisoned him. Good Lord, you don't think that. They are frightened, said Reggie placidly. I frightened them quite a lot. And if it was somebody else, the child is going away and Mrs. Warnham will be eating and drinking everything he eats and drinks. The small Gerald will be all right. There remains only the little problem. Who was it? It's a diabolical affair. Who could want to kill that child? Diabolical is the word, Reggie agreed, and a little simple food is what we need. And they went into the club, and through a long tea he talked to Eden of rock gardens and Chinese nursery rhymes. But when Eden, somewhat dazed by his appetite and the variety of his conversation, was gone, he made for that corner of the club where Lomas sat, drinking tea made in the Russian manner. He pointed a finger at the clear, weak fluid. It was sad and bad and mad, and it was not even sweet, he complained. Take care, Lomas. Think what's happened to Russia. You would never be happy as a Bolshevik. I understand that the detective police force is the one institution which has survived in Russia. Put down that repulsive concoction and come and take the air. Lomas stared at him in horror. 
"'Where's your young lady? I thought you were walking out. "'You're a faithless fellow, Fortune. Go and walk like a little gentleman.' But there was that in Reggie's eye which made him get up with a groan. You're the most ruthless man I know. The car moved away from the club, and Reggie shrank under his rug as the January east wind met them. I hope you are cold, said Lomas. What is it now? It was nearly another anonymous murder, and Reggie told him the story. Diabolical, said Lomas. Yes, I believe in the devil, Reggie nodded. Who stood to gain by the child's death? It's clear enough there's only Warnham. Mrs. Warnham was left a rich woman when her first husband died, old Staveley. Everyone knew that was why Warnham was after her, but the bulk of the fortune would go to the child, so he took the necessary action. Good gad, we all know Crab Warnham didn't stick at a trifle, but this, cold-blooded scoundrel, can you make a case of it? "'I like you, Lomas. You're so natural,' Reggie said. "'That's all quite clear, and it's all wrong. "'This case isn't natural, you see. "'It hath a devil.' "'Do you mean to say it wasn't Warnham?' "'It wasn't Warnham. "'I tried to frighten him. "'He was frightened, but not for himself, "'because the child has an enemy, "'and he doesn't know who it is. "'Oh, my dear fellow, "'he's not a murderer because you like his face.' Who could like his face? No. The poison was given at the party where Warnham wasn't. But why? What possible motive? Some homicidal lunatic goes to a Kensington children's party and picks out this one child to poison. Not very credible, is it? No, it's diabolical. I didn't say a lunatic. When you tell me what lunacy is, we'll discuss whether the poisoner was sane but the diabolical is getting a little too common, Lomas. There was Bigod, young, healthy, well-off, just engaged to a jolly girl. He falls into a chalk pit, and the jury says it was misadventure. There was the lady doctor, young, clean-living, not a ghost of a past, everybody liking her. She is murdered, and a girl who was very fond of her nearly goes mad over it. Now there's the small Gerald, a dear kid. His mother worships him. His stepfather's mighty keen on him. Everybody likes him. Somebody tries to poison him and nearly brings it off. What are you arguing, Fortune? It's odd the cases should follow one another. Deuced awkward. We can't clean them up. But what then? They're not really related. The people are unconnected. There's a different method of murder, if the bigot case was murder. The only common feature is that the man who attempted murder is not known. You think so? Well, well, what I want to know is, was there any one at Mrs. Lawley's party in Kensington who was also at the home of help party and also staying somewhere near the chalk pit when Bigot fell into it? Put your men on to that. Good gad, said Lomas, but the cases are not comparable, not in the same class. Different method, different kind of victim. What motive could any creature have for picking out just these three to kill? Reggie looked at him. Not nice murders, are they, he said. I could guess, and I dare say, will only guess in the end. That night he was taking Miss Amber, poor girl, to a state dinner of his relations. They had ten minutes together before the horrors of the ceremony began and she was benign to him about the recovery of the small Gerald. It was dear of you to ring up and tell me. I love Jerry. Poor Mrs. Warnham. I just had to go round to her, and she was sweet. But she has been frightened. You're rather a wonderful person, sir. I didn't know you were a children's doctor, as well as a million other things. What was the matter? Mrs. Warnham didn't tell us. It must... Who are us, Joan? Why, Lady Chantry was with her. She didn't tell us what it really was. After we came away, Lady Chantry asked me if I knew. But I'm afraid you don't, Reggie said. Joan, I don't want you to talk about the small Jerry. Do you mind? My dear, of course not. Her eyes grew bigger. But Reggie, the boy's going to be all right. Yes, yes. You're rather a dear, you know. And at the dinner table, which then received them, 
his family found him of an unwanted solemnity it was agreed with surprise and reluctance that engagement had improved him that there might be some merit in miss amber after all a week went by he had been separated from miss amber for one long afternoon to give evidence in the case of the illegitimate pekingese when she rang him up on the telephone lady chantry she said had asked her to choose a day and bring mr fortune to dine lady chantry did so want to know him does she though said mr fortune she was so nice about it said the telephone and she really is a good sort reggie she's always doing something kind joan said mr fortune you're not to go into her house reggie said the telephone that's that said mr fortune i'll speak to lady chantry lady chantry was at home she sat in her austerely pleasant drawing-room toasting a foot at the fire a small foot which brought out a pretty leg of course she was in black with some white about her neck but the loose gown had grace she smiled at him and tossed back her hair not a thread of white showed in its crisp brown and it occurred to reggie that he had never seen a woman of her age carry off bobbed hair so well what was her age her eyes were as bright as a bird's and her clear pallor was unfurrowed so good of you mr fortune miss amber has just told me they spoke together she got the lead then it was kind of her to let you know at once but she's always kind isn't she i did so want you to come and make friends with me before you're married and it will be very soon now won't it oh but do let me give you some tea no tea thank you won't you well please ring the bell i don't know how men can exist without tea but most of them don't now do they you're almost unique you know i suppose it's the penalty of greatness i came round to say that miss amber won't be able to dine with you lady chantry it was a moment before she answered but that is too bad she told me she was sure you could find a day she can't come said reggie sharply the man has spoken she laughed oh of course she mustn't go behind that he was given a keen mocking glance and can't you come either mr fortune i have a great deal of work lady chantry it's come rather unexpectedly indeed you do look worried i'm so sorry i'm sure you ought to take a rest a long rest a servant came in won't you really have some tea no thank you good-bye lady chantry he went home and rang up lomas lomas like the father of baby bunting had gone a-hunting lomas was in leicestershire superintendent bell replied did bell know if they had anything new about the unknown murderer inquiries are proceeding it sir said superintendent bell damn it bell i'm not the house of commons have you got anything not what you'd call definite sir no you'll say that on the day of judgment said reggie it was on the next day that he found a telegram waiting for him when he came home to dress for dinner gerald ill again very anxious beg you will come sending car to meet evening trains warnham fernhurst blackover he scrambled into the last carriage of the half-past six as it drew out of waterloo mrs warnham had faithfully obeyed his orders to take gerald to a quiet place blackover stands an equally uncomfortable distance from two main lines one of which throws out towards it a feeble and spasmodic branch after two changes reggie arrived cold and with a railway sandwich rattling in his emptiness on the dimly lit platform of blackover the porter of all work who took his ticket thought there was a car outside in the dark station yard reggie found only one do you come from fernhurst he called and the small chauffeur who was half inside the bonnet shut it up and touched his cap and ran round to his seat they dashed off into the night climbing up by narrow winding roads through woodland nothing passed them no house gave a gleam of light the car stopped on the crest of a hill and reggie looked out 
He could see nothing but white frost and pines. The chauffeur was getting down. "'What's the trouble?' said Reggie, with his head out of window, and slipped the catch and came out in a bundle. The chauffeur's face was the face of Lady Chantry. He saw it in the flash of a pistol overhead as he closed with her. "'I will, I will,' she muttered, and fought him fiercely. Another shot went into the pines. He wrenched her hand round. The third was fired into her face. The struggling body fell away from him, limp. He carried it into the rays of the headlights and looked close. That's that, he said with a shrug, and put it into the car. He lit a cigar and listened. There was no sound anywhere but the sough of the wind in the pines. He climbed into the chauffeur's place and drove away. At the next crossroads he took that which led north and west, and so in a while came out on the Portsmouth Road. That night the frost gathered on a motor car in a lane between Hindhead and Shotter Mill. Mr. Fortune unobtrusively caught the last train from Hazelmere. When he came out from a matinee with Joan Amber next day, the newsboys were shouting, Motor Car Mystery! Mr. Fortune did not buy a paper. It was on the morning of the second day that Scotland Yard sent for him. Glomus was with Superintendent Bell. The two of them received him with solemnity and curious eyes. Mr. Fortune was not pleased. "'Dear me, Lomas, can't you keep the peace for a week at a time?' he protested. "'What is the reason for your existence?' "'I had all that for breakfast,' said Lomas. "'Don't talk like the newspapers. Be original.' "'Another mysterious murder,' Reggie murmured, quoting headlines. "'Scotland Yard baffled again. Police mandarins. "'No, you haven't a good press, Lomas, old thing.' "'Lomas said something about the press.' Do you know who that woman chauffeur was, Fortune? That wasn't in the papers, was it? You haven't guessed? Again, Reggie Fortune was aware of the grave curiosity in their eyes. Another of our mysterious murders, he said dreamily. I wonder. Are you working out the series at last? I told you to look for someone who was always present. Lomas looked at Superintendent Bell. Lady Chantry was present at this one, Fortune, he said. Lady Chantry took out her car the day before yesterday. Yesterday morning, the car was found in a lane above Hasselmere. Lady Chantry was inside. She wore chauffeur's uniform. She was shot through the head. Well, well, said Reggie Fortune. I want you to come down and look at the body. Is the body the only evidence? We know where she bought the coat and cap. Her own coat and hat were under the front seat. She told her servant she might not be back at night. No one knows what she went out for or where she went. Yes, yes, when a person is shot, it's generally with a gun. Have you found it? She had an automatic pistol in her hand. Reggie Fortune rose. I had better see her, he said sadly. A wearing world, Lomas. Come on, my car's outside. Two hours later he stood looking down at the slight body and the scorched wound in that pale face, while a police surgeon demonstrated to him how the shot was fired. The pistol was gripped with the rigor of death in the woman's right hand. The bullet that was taken from the base of the skull fitted it. The muzzle, remarked the stained scorched flesh, must have been held close to her face when the shot was fired. And Reggie listened and nodded. Yes, yes, all very clear, isn't it? A straight case. He drew the sheet over the body and paid compliments to the doctor as they went out. Lomas was in a hurry to meet them. Reggie shook his head. There's nothing for me, Lomas, and nothing for you. The medical evidence is suicide. Scotland Yard is acquitted without a stain on its character. No sort of doubt, said Lomas. You can bring all the College of Surgeons to see her. You'll get nothing else. And so they climbed into the car again. Finney, thank God, said Mr. Fortune, as the little town ran by. Lomas looked at him curiously. Why did she commit suicide, Fortune, he said. There are also other little questions, Reggie murmured. 
Why did she murmur bigod? Why did she murder the lady doctor? Why did she try to murder the child? Lomas continued to stare at him. How do you know she did? He said in a low voice. You're making very sure. Great heavens, you might do some of the work. I know Scotland Yard isn't brilliant, but it might take pains. Who was present at all the murders? Who was the constant force? Haven't you found that out yet? She was staying near Bigod's place. She was at the orphanage. She was at the child's party. And only she was at all three. It staggered me when I got the evidence complete. But what in heaven makes you think she is the murderer? Reggie moved uneasily. There was something malign about her. Malign? But she was always doing philanthropic work. Yes, it may be a saint who does that. Or the other thing. Haven't you ever noticed some of the people who are always busy about distress? They rather like watching distress. Why, yes, but murder. And what possible motive is there for killing these different people? She might have hated one or another, but not all three. Oh, there is a common factor, don't you see? Each one had somebody to feel the death like torture. The girl Bigod was engaged to, the girl who was devoted to the lady doctor, the small Gerald's mother. There was always somebody to suffer horribly, and the person to be killed was always somebody who had a young, good life to lose. Not at all nice murders, Lomas. Genus Diabolical, Species Feminine Say that Lady Chantry had a devilish passion for cruelty, and it ended that night in the motor car. But why commit suicide? Do you mean she was mad? I wouldn't say that. That's for the Day of Judgment. When is cruelty madness? I don't know. Why did she give herself away in the end? Perhaps she found she had gone a little too far. Perhaps she knew you and I had begun to look after her. She never liked me much, I fancy. She was a little odd with me. You're an uncanny fellow, Fortune. My dear chap. Oh, my dear chap, I'm wholly normal. I'm the natural man. End of section 10. Recording by Nan Dodge. End of Mr. Fortune's Practice by H. C. Bailey.